to see you today in the Lord's house. Thank you for allowing us a week away last week. Uh, we were having our anniversary, so celebrating 34 years of marriage last Saturday. So I'm thankful for that. And I'm thankful for those that came and sang and did special music. Thank you. And I'm thankful for the pastor, that Vince, that came and spoke. But I, we're glad to be back. I told her it seems like it's been a long time since we've been here, but we're glad to be back. So let's stand together and sing Good, Good Father. Good, Good Father. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like. But I've heard the tender whisper of love In the dead of night You tell me that you're pleased And that I'm never alone You're a good, good father It's who you are It's who you are It's who you are and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. I've seen many searching for answers far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers only provide you know just what we need before we say a word you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and i'm loved by you it's who i am it's who i am it's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. To us, love so undeniable. Hardly speak peace so unexplainable. I can hardly think as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still into love, love, love. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Such a great father to us, willing to give us everything that we need for life and breath, the ability to go on and on, because he's a great God. Amen? Amen. We're going to go ahead and sing that now, how great is our God. Rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wrapped 
wraps himself in light and darkness tries to hide and trembles at his voice and trembles at his voice how great is our god sing with me how great is our god and all will see how great how great is our god and age to age he stands and time is in his hands beginning and the end beginning and the end the godhead three Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. above all names worthy of all praise my heart will sing how great is our God name above all names worthy of all praise my heart will how great is our God, how great is our God, sing with me how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God, how great our God. Sing with me how great is our God. How great, how great is our God. Amen. Please be seated. A lot of things to be celebrating and thankful for today. As I said, Darcy and I were able to get away and have a few days away for our anniversary. Um, we went to San Diego Canyon Estates. Does anybody know where that is? San Diego Canyon Estates. So you, you, it's like between Ramona and Barona Casino and Julian. So it's sort of set off. There's uh, some uh, there's a racket club there that's where we stayed and we got a real cheap rate on a room and it was nice to stay there and we went to a couple of other places and it was just we got a shop in Ramona and go to Winola and Santa Isabel and uh, we just had a good time and enjoyed ourselves so uh, I'm thankful that we were able to rest sometimes we just did nothing more than just sit in the room read watch TV just rest and so that's what we needed as we had been very busy. Um, we are thankful uh, that God is doing some good things. Uh, we had a young lady, 93, 93 years of age, that contacted us and said she wanted to come to church. And she was fully intending on coming this morning. Now, Jerry and I would have had to go get her and bring her in, but uh, it just didn't happen today because her leg is hurting. She said, I must have been running from the dentist because my leg was hurting. And I don't feel like coming today. So that's all right. That's all right. We'll take that. But uh, that was great to hear it. And uh, Ricardo's wife, God is really working there and doing some things with Ricardo and his family. Uh, he prays with his daughters, and he said his wife joined in in prayer. So that's awesome as well. And uh, he said that he had some questions. He watched a video um, that denies the Trinity. And he goes, and I remember a message you preached about that. And he said, I am so thankful. 
I could review that and look at it, and it helped me understand again. So I'm glad, he said, I was glad the Holy Spirit worked. Um, Darcy, when you come in, if you can close that door to your left, please. That door right there. Virgil parked, and the sun is shining right off of his car in my eye. And that's all I can see. We'll see if that door will fix it when it closes. No, I don't need those lights brighter, Katie. All right. Thank you, Darcy. All right. No, I don't need those clothes. Just that one. All right. I, it's almost so bright I can't even see my paperwork up here this morning. So um, the Breyer family is either already on the field or getting close to going to the field. Remember, we had them here in our church, and we've taken them on to support them. So that's awesome. And uh, things are happening. I went to see Jed. He's doing much better. Uh, in fact, he's even been uh, taking his walker and try, or his wheelchair and getting over to Donnie's house for prayer and Bible study. So that's great to hear that for them. So uh, a lot of blessings. Who else has an answer? To, well, have another birthday. So this gentleman over here by the name of John, raise your hand, raise your hand, raise your hand and wave. John just had a, it's today today i'll let you can ask him how old he is i won't share that information because i'll just say this when you get to be a certain and this will probably tell you how old he is when you get to be a certain age you start thinking man i'm not going to tell anybody how old i am after a while john you get to the point where you say i don't really care anybody can know how old i am it doesn't matter but we understand all right so any other else have an answer to prayer or praise the lord today katie Okay. Amen. Amen. Okay. Trisha. All right. Amen. 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 Congratulations. Jeremy. All right. Amen. Amen. So, birthdays. Uh, Damien be able to eat another anniversary just God's doing Jeremy getting things taken care of with his car yes sir okay amen from the hospital amen 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 that was a real answer to prayer we were praying for him so thank you for that information all right so uh, Jerry's grandson is out of the hospital and they're going to be able to make their move. So that's a praise the Lord as well. All right, so here's some prayer requests. I talked to Brandon Fuller this morning. Uh, some of you remember Brandon came and gave his testimony about how God had been with him through COVID, and uh, he's having some heart conditions, so he's at the hospital right now waiting for heart surgery. And he said, please pray for me. So we said we would. And I told Ida this morning when I talked to her, I said, we'll pray for you that the pain will go down in your leg so that you can come to church. She goes, I miss singing, I miss fellowshipping, I miss the reading of the word and prayer, I miss all of that, and I want to come to church. And she's just at the veterans home up here by the hospital. So uh, easy enough for us to get her. I was talking to our expert back here on getting to church properly with an MTS bus, and he was giving me the information for that. So that might work best for her, but we want her to come. We want her to come. So pray for her. And uh, keep, uh, Debbie had her surgery, uh, and so she's doing good in re recovery, Debbie Johnson, and we want to pray for her. I talked to a fellow pastor uh, that I have a lot of respect for, and I told him I would pray. His name is Sean Bowden. Uh, he spent time in prison and came to the Lord. I think he said he'd been about eight years off and on in prison, and he said God finally got a hold of him, and he is... Uh, very much in, in involved with outreach and working with the city and doing all kinds of stuff with his church. But he said, will you pray for my dad? He only has about three months to live. The cancer is through and through. And he said, we're praying for him because he doesn't know Jesus. And I said, let me pray right now with you. And so we prayed. And then I said, we'll start praying for your dad that he'll come to Christ. So I don't have his name, but it's Sean, and I'll put it in the bullet in the prayer sheet, Sean Bowden. And it's his dad that needs Jesus Christ. So if you'll pray for his dad to come to Christ. 
as we're talking about that, remember Liz's family and their need for Christ and Jerry's family, their need for Christ and others, uh, Isabel's family, and uh, we, we know there are several others, Peggy uh, and Blanca, the Biddlecom family. Uh, Mary just had a birthday, if you remember Mary Campbell, but keep in prayer for her family as well. The Lord might do some great things there. And continue to pray for work for Randy. He would like to change. And we are now officially in Easter season. You realize how close we are to Easter? It's just a few Sundays away. So these are on the back table. I've set it up so you can write a note and put a, a stamp on it and mail it to somebody or hand it to somebody and say, hey, come to church. And we're going to have Easter eggs for the kids after the service. And we're going to have a good time together. And so uh, let's celebrate Easter. Let's celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ on April the 17th. And now I'm tentatively put on here a sunrise meeting. Uh, who's ever been to an Easter sunrise service? Okay, some of you have. And sunrise comes pretty early. Jerry and I find that out on Mondays when we go out and stand out here. So uh, are we going to have music? Possibly. Are we going to be outside? Most likely. Um, we're just maybe going to praise in Thanksgiving. We won't take a long time, but some people it's sort of neat to do. And uh, so I just want to offer it to you. I figure I'm up at dawn anyway, so I might as well come and see if anybody else wants to come. Uh, the special service is the week previous on the 13th, and we're going to do a very special communion service here. So if you don't normally come on Wednesday nights, uh, Set Free is going to take part in it with us. If you want to come and take part of that communion service, uh, then please schedule that. It'll be at 6.30 on the 13th, and some of you know have been here to those before. So pray for Easter. Pray that God will work. Is there any other requests today? Yes. Okay. Okay. For Mrs. Bradshaw, the Lord can be with her. She's still fighting some allergy things and some cough. Okay. Amen. All right. We'll keep her in prayer. Yes, Mrs. Hatch. All right. For Debbie Larson, unspoken. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord for answers to prayer, for meeting this lady that wants to come to church, uh, for things that you've been doing and blessing. Uh, thank you for uh, taking care of us, Lord, throughout the week. Thank you for giving us anniversaries and birthdays and celebrations, Lord. Thank you for allowing things to work right in businesses and giving us the hours we need or the dollars that we need to take care of our families. Um, Lord, we are praying that you might be with us as we look ahead to Easter that we can invite people and we'll see a lot of people come, maybe some that haven't been in a while, come back and, and we can have a great service and talk about Jesus and what you've done. Lord, I just pray that you might help us at that time. Uh, we pray for unspoken requests today. You know what they are. I ask that you might work in a mighty way in those lives. Uh, we pray for Brandon as he's waiting for surgery. Uh, we pray for Jed. We pray for Joanna as she's waiting for surgery, for Yvonne and her and uh, also Debbie Stevens. Lord, we pray for families and individuals that need Jesus Christ. We pray for Liz's family. We pray for also uh, Jerry's family, for Isabel's family. Uh, Lord, we all know somebody that needs Jesus Christ, and so we pray that you might help them to see the need in their own life so that they might open up their heart to Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be back here in the Lord's house today. Uh, we pray for those who are normally here that are not here today, uh, that you might be with them and help them. Um, we just ask that you might bless our service. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, Katie, are you ready to go? All right, I think you might have to get one of them out of the nursery. Oh, maybe. Okay. All right. In human culture going back to the very beginning man was created with a relationship with God man was in the garden Eve was there with him and God walked in the garden with him all the time 
So man knew God personally, face to face. And of course, we blew it. We disobeyed. We were rebellious. We tried to hide. God found us. But then from that point, even in Genesis chapter 3, the devil tried to slip in that there were some faults. The first one is basically that God has not told you the truth. And so try to break that perfect conception of God. And then mankind came up with the idea of having false gods. Now, they didn't label them false gods, but you have the, the Greek pantheon of, and then the Roman pantheon. You have Jupiter and Thor and Mercury and Venus and all of those gods and goddesses. The thing about it was all of them had faults. All of those, it, so man would look at their gods, but then they would realize that my God has a fault. We even see that in the Bible where the idols are carved and they have eyes that cannot see and ears that cannot hear and noses that cannot smell and mouths that cannot speak. Well, we come now to the modern era and we see the arise of superheroes. The earliest superhero I can remember, his theme song sort of went like this. And you see now Jerry and... Uh, Randy, you guys don't get a guess on this one. But this is what part of his theme song was. Here I come to save the day. Anybody remember? Mighty Mouse. Very good. Mighty Mouse. And so my parents would let me watch. Mighty Mouse, Felix the Cat. We'll bring up some other ones in the future. Maybe I'll sing some of their theme songs as well. But there's something to be noticed about those different uh, mighty superheroes. Did Mighty Mouse ever have a failing? Sometimes he would fly around and do stuff, and then he would have to rest for a little bit. And then he could start up again. And if you think about it, all of our superheroes in the entire Marvel and DC universe, Batman, Spider-Man, all of them, they all have a fault. Superman is kryptonite, right? And if he's around enough kryptonite, even though he was born and raised on the planet Krypton, if he's around enough, it'll kill him, right? So all of our superheroes have faults. And you might say, well, that's a good thing because then we can see that God is the only real hero, that Jesus is the real hero. But I'll say that Satan is working because he wants us to think that Jesus has faults. Because if Jesus has faults and weaknesses, then Jesus can't be the Savior, and we'll see that in the message today. And we're going to be looking at how Jesus overcame and was able to do things that our superheroes, <laughs> however great they are, can't really do. Because Satan doesn't want us to see Jesus as the perfect Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He doesn't want us to see that God is perfect and holy and righteous. He wants us instead to think that God has faults. It's raining, it's snoring. It's raining, it's pouring. The old man is snoring. That's God, and he's old, and he's on a rocking chair, and he's not paying any attention to what's going on. So if Satan can get us to have that, then we don't really have a true God. We don't have a true Savior. Well, I want you to know that Jesus is the only real hero Amen. Amen. and some of the storylines about the heroes that have died to save humanity we'll talk about that pale in comparison to the true story of the gospel about how jesus died to save the world amen so we're going to spend some time talking about jesus i'm i'm sorry if it bothers you that we're going to talk about jesus but he's the best thing that's ever happened Amen? And so today, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, and we're going to be reading this story about Jesus facing temptation. In the Gospels, we're told that Jesus came, and he was baptized, and the Spirit immediately caught him up, and he went into the wilderness, where he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And then Satan came and began to tempt him. Now, Superman is weakened by kryptonite. 
So my question to you today is sin Jesus' kryptonite? Because some would say, well, maybe Jesus could have sinned. And I say to you that Jesus could not have sinned. And Jesus did not sin. He was tempted as we are, but he did not sin. Is what the Word of God tells us. So let's look. Jesus is tempted to sin by the devil. Jesus is tempted to sin by the devil. Matthew chapter 4 reads this, verses 1 through 11. Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness. Immediately after he was baptized, before he begins his ministry, before the wedding feast at Cana, he is taken away to be tempted. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now, we have a problem fasting half a day. I've read about people that fast for 40 days and 40 nights, and then they say it's important, one, to make sure your doctor's going to approve that first. And secondly, even though you may not be eating anything, it's important to uh, keep up a liquid intake and not necessarily just water because there are things that your body needs. And if you're going to go 40 days, then you need to have still some of those supplements. But there are people that have tried and done this. Jesus does this for 40 days and 40 nights. And in his perfect humanness, he's like us. It says he was hungry. It says he was hungry. And this sets him up for this first temptation. Now when the tempter, and you can say that's the devil, that's Satan, that's Lucifer, because that's who it is. When he came to him, he said, if, if, <laughs> let's cast some doubt on so Jesus, in his weakened state, he's hungry. He's totally human, totally God. But if you're the Son of God, he's trying to cast doubt into Jesus' mind. If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Now, I, have you ever been so hungry that you look at something and you say, man, that looks really good? I probably could eat that. Maybe you've heard about people that have been so thirsty they put a stone in their mouth, like a smooth stone to make your saliva glands flow and so you have a little bit, it can quench your thirst a little bit. I don't know that I've ever gotten to the point where I would look at, a, you know, Yule Gibbons would say, some parts of a pine tree are edible. Remember those advertisements with Yule Gibbons? Huh. I don't know what part is. I don't know that I want to find out what part is because uh, that doesn't sound very good to me. But to look at something, but the devil says, hey, Jesus, if you're truly the Son of God, you're hungry, command that those stones over there become bread. That was a temptation. We'll tell you what, how that fits into our human psyche in just a minute. But he, Jesus, answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's a direct quotation from the word of God. Jesus knows the word because he is the word, all right? But he answers it with a verse. Well, what's wrong with Jesus giving in to temptation? We are not supposed to give in to temptation. We're supposed to resist temptation. And it's who's tempting him. Is it okay for Jesus to be hungry? Yes. Is it okay, okay for Jesus to get something to eat? Absolutely, but not under the temptation of the devil, not following the guidance of the devil. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, that's Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, that was the highest point of the temple. Jesus has been in the temple before when he was a young man. Remember, he was there when he was 12, and, but, and he is going to show a sign that he's the Son of God eventually. But the devil takes him up on the pinnacle and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written... Now, I want you to see this. Jesus quoted scripture at the first temptation, right? You shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Okay, so now Satan, qu 
quotes Scripture. The devil knows the Bible. So if you think, hey, I can do something and I can find proof in the Word of God that it's okay for me to do it, better be careful. You better be careful. Make sure it matches up with the rest of the Word of God. That's not just some cockamamie idea you have that will cover over and give you permission to sin because there's nowhere in the Bible that we get permission to sin. The devil knows how to quote too. It is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Those are in Psalms. Jesus, you can do it because you'll be okay. You can go, you can jump from that high point and you'll be okay. Did you see in the news this past week where a guy tried to base jump off of a local building and they found him at the bottom with his helmet and his parachute had not deployed? Did you see that in the news? And I read recently over in Switzerland there was like a group of five people that jumped off of a building and they found him at the bottom of the building. So, Jesus is going to be seen by a large crowd because he's at the temple. It's the center point of their culture. Jump off. You'll be okay if you're the Son of God. Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Don't try to confuse Jesus. Don't try to get him to fall to sin. Don't tempt God. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kings, kingdoms of the world and their glory. Now, I don't know if that was Mount Everest. I don't know if that was Mount Nebo. Remember, Moses went up on Mount Nebo and saw over the entire land and what it looked like. But it's just a very high mountain, and they could see the world laid out. This is pre-smog, right? Must not have been a lot of wood smoke in the air. Jesus could see, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. And he, the devil, said to him, Jesus, all these things I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Now, Jesus obviously was hungry, and Jesus actually wants the Jews to know that he's the Son of God, and he'll do that by, by the signs of healing and the signs of bringing people back from the dead and all these things to prove that he's the Son of God. And so to jump off the temple, you could argue, well, yeah, that would have worked because he would have jumped off and he lived. But here now, it's a little different. Satan is the ruler of this world, but who is the ultimate one that's going to be on the throne? Jesus Christ. I've read the end of the book. He's going to be on the throne of the kingdoms of this world. But the devil says, I'll give all of this up to you if you'll fall down and worship me. Now that goes back into the Old Testament when the devil uh, in Isaiah and Ezekiel rebelled against God. I mean, the devil's was, name was Lucifer uh, and he was in charge of praise in heaven and he said, I want to be lifted up higher than God. So I'm supposed to be praising God but I want to get to the point where God will praise me. So Jesus, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world if you'll just fall down and worship me. Well, that's Jesus' ultimate goal. He's going to sit on the throne in Jerusalem for a thousand years and rule the world. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. And the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. The other Gospels say that when the devil left, that he was also looking for a more opportune time, and we think that maybe the devil came back when Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. Let this cup pass from me, not my will, but thy will be done. But that it continued on. But the angels come and help him because Jesus has passed the test. Instead of giving in and eating the fruit of the tree, like Eve does, he says, I'm not going to give in. I cannot give in to sin. He's absolutely human. 
and absolutely God. In 1 John, John gives us a little bit of a description of these three temptations and how they work on us. All right? Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. The lust of the flesh is hunger. Did you know the number one drive in the human body is hunger? You say, yeah, I'm feeling it right about now because it's almost lunchtime. Don't talk about food too much. and We're glad nobody's cooking any grill around here because we start smelling that and we start thinking, man, I'm getting hungry. Good thing our church is not close to in and out right? You were driven by there and smelled that? Whoo! I'd be preaching short messages. But that's the number one drive, okay? In America, we've pretty much met that. There's not a whole lot of hunger going on, although... Michael, I'm sure there's a few times that you're hungry, okay? The second strongest urge of the human in the flesh is for sexual pleasure and reproduction. So that's why when you have a commercial for a new car, they don't have like a hamburger next to it saying, ooh, look, if you buy this truck, we'll give you a hamburger. What do they have? They have a beautiful woman, maybe dressed scantily, and you get this idea of, wow, if I buy that car, maybe I'll get her too. It doesn't work that way, right? Or it shouldn't. But that's the temptation to give in to the lust of the flesh. You know what we call that? We call that hedonism. Hedonism. Then we have the lust of the eyes. I want that. I covet that. Jesus to jump off of the temple. That's materialism. I've got to have something more and something better. Hopefully, on Saturday, if nothing happens, I'm going to go to the car show at Del Mar Fairgrounds. And I like looking at cars. And I've taken my daughters before. I can't wait for Ezra to be old enough to go and me to explain things to him. This is a vent window. This is the difference between a 55, a 56, and a 57 Chevrolet. It's interesting. There are some differences that are minor and some differences that are major. And if you know that, you can tell a 55 right away, a 56 right away, and a 57 right away. Right? We all know the 57's got those real pointed fins. The 56, the gas cap is not on the side of the car, and it's not got a pointed fin, but the gas cap is behind the tail light on the left side. The little lever you flip and it opens up. The 50, 55 has a gas door on the side left rear fender. That's how you can quickly tell the difference between the three. And I'm going to go and look. But you know, we have something called planned obs obsolescence. That it might be the same chassis of the car from 20 years ago, but they've just modernized the body and they've added all the doodads. And while you might still have a car that's like Jerry's car, from what year is it? 2005, with however many miles on it, it's still a perfectly good car, but it doesn't look up to date. I, I, he doesn't need Bluetooth anyway, but I doubt that he has Bluetooth in his car. But it's always, we need something better. We need something better. And so people are given into materialism, the lust of the eyes. One of the Ten Commandments is, thou shalt not covet. You, don't, you shouldn't want what other people have. The third one was the pride of life. And that's egoism. I want to be built up. Jesus, if you worship me, I'll give you all these kingdoms. Satan, I, I, they're already mine. You just have temporary control until I evict you, and then they're all mine. They're promised me from the very beginning. We face those same temptations, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And so Jesus is tempted in the same way we are. And where we fail, he did not. Amen? The world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. 
So Jesus is victorious over temptation. And that's so important that he's victorious over temptation, that he does not sin. Now, I've talked to you before about temptation. The temptation in itself is not sin. It's when you give in to temptation that it becomes sin. So when the temptation comes, you need to say, I'm not going to give in. Jesus, even though he was weak, 40 days of no food, does not give in because he can't be the perfect lamb of God if he gives in. He can't die. Well, he could die on the cross, but it would do us no good at all if he was not victorious over temptation. Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. He's given us that reconciliation. He's given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin. That's the phrase that I want you to see. He made him who knew no sin. You see, Jesus Christ is not just a man that sinned. He was born illegitimately to Mary, and he's a sinner like all of us. Nope, he's the Son of God, the perfect lamb without any spot or blemish he knew no sin now this part breaks my heart but it also thrills my heart because when jesus was on the cross my sin as dirty and as filthy as they could possibly be were put on the one that knew no sin do you understand what that means That's why it was dark for the space of several hours because God, if it were, turned his back on him. He couldn't look at him. He made him who knew no sin. Jesus was victorious and yet he took my sin on himself and that makes me feel really bad. But also I'm really excited because then I don't have to worry about it anymore because my sins are gone. I've been set free. They're gone. Far as the east is from the west. But he knew no sin that's important we could not be reconciled with god unless the perfect lamb of god and so jesus has no faults he's the real hero except no substitutes that we might become the righteousness of god in him hebrews chapter 4 verses verse 15 this is speaking about jesus christ we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. I've never tried to fast for 40 days. And you might say, Pastor, that's very evident. We can look at you right now. Folks, I'll tell you something right now. I'm going to face a terrible temptation here in just a few months. Some of you have either gone with me to Handel's Ice Cream or you've heard me talk about Handel's Ice Cream and how good Handel's Ice Cream is. The closest one is either a 30-minute drive to Santee off of Mission Gorge or up to Del Mar Heights, which is another 30-minute drive. So guaranteed, I don't go to Handel's Ice Cream very often. It's good, isn't it, Jerry? All right, I've taken Jerry there on a special day. Okay, now, we were at Chick-fil-A over here at Miles a Car Way having breakfast, and I look in the window of one of the empty storefronts, and it says, Handel's Ice Cream coming soon. So there's going to be a Handel's ice cream within five minutes of my house. I'm going to have to be careful. The Bible does talk about the sin of gluttony. Did you know that? You can't tell it sometimes because of the size of the the Baptist people because we like the fellowship with food, let's face it. So I'm going to face that temptation. I'm going to have to say, no, I don't. I I know it's good. I know it. I really like it, but I'm going to have to say no all the time. But Jesus was tempted like us in our weaknesses. Forty days of no food turned the stones into bread. And he can sympathize with us when we struggle with temptation. 
But in all points he was tempted as we are, yet without sin. You see that? Superman has kryptonite. Is sin Jesus' kryptonite? Absolutely not, because he did not give in. He did not sin. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 to 24, we read these things. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. Who, when as we reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. They came to Jesus when he was on the cross and they shouted at him and they spit on him and they cursed him and they beat him. They'd already beaten him and flogged him and yet he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And then his last words were, it is finished and he committed his spirit to the Father's hands and he died. He gave up his own life. That's a whole other message. We didn't take the life of the Son of God. He gave up his life willingly for you and me. But the important part that we saw in this verse it was he committed no sin. Right? Well, he, he's just the son of a Roman soldier and Mary and, and he was just a good prophet and he did some good things and, and then just as he went through life, yeah, he probably... Now, you know, he ended up marrying Mary Magdalene and, and his kids are now in, uh, in France and just all these things. No, 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 no. That's not the story of Jesus Christ. Don't take that substitute. That's a false Christ. He was born into a virgin Mary and he was raised. And I love Ezra, but Ezra can be a liar. You know your kids were liars when you raised them? Your grandkids are liars and cheats and thieves it's because we have a human heart and we're desperately wicked jesus did no sin at all growing up he never lied to his parents he never stole anything from the grocery store or the hardware store i forget who i was in, in the hardware store i think it might have been darcy and she said do i need to watch and make sure you don't take any screws and nails and nuts and bolts and you know that story but Jesus did not sin. He is victorious over sin. He's the real hero. He himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Amen. Jesus had to be without sin to be the Savior. He had to be. So he couldn't have. If he'd given in and sinned, he couldn't be the Savior. I don't know if you catch that, if you understand that. Well, he's just a good teacher. He's just a good man. No, he's the perfect Son of God. He's the Lamb that died to take away my sin because he's perfect. In 1 Peter, we read these words, chapter 1. But as he, Jesus, who called you, is holy... You also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. What does holy mean? It means without sin. If you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. Salvation doesn't come by how much money you give, or how much time you serve, or how much ministry you work. Salvation comes as a gift. When I give a gift to my, my wife, I give a gift to my grandson, I give a gift to somebody, I go and take what I've been given, my money, my time, and, or I work on this, and I present it as a gift. They don't have to do anything to take that. It's a gift. That's what salvation is. You can't earn it. You can't buy it. You have to get it from Jesus Christ. And he is not corruptible. The precious blood of Christ. As a lamb without blemish and without spot. He was the perfect 
Lamb of God with no sin at all until my sin was placed on him at the cross. And your sin was placed there as well. Hebrews chapter 1, we read these things. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, though through whom he also made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. If Jesus was a sinner, he could not have purged our sins by his power alone. The price for our sins in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus. Through who? Jesus Christ, our Lord. He purged our sins. He's done it because he was sinless. We also read this in Hebrews chapter 9. But Christ came as the high priest of the good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and of calves, but with his own blood. He entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Now this brings up an interesting point. Somebody said, was somebody, an angel, standing at the foot of the cross as Jesus is dying and collecting his blood in a bowl to carry off into heaven. In the Old Testament, when they would kill an animal, they would drain the blood out of it before they would burn the body. So they would cut the neck and they would drain the blood and the blood would be put different places to symbolize. But without the shedding of blood is no remission of sins. We're told that in Hebrews. So... And so they say that when the Passover lambs were killed and that blood was shed, it was like a creek running out of Jerusalem down to the valley of blood. I, I, that must have been some sight to see. But that blood was a temporary covering for sin because it had to be covered with the eternal blood of Jesus Christ. So no, I don't believe an angel collected it, but I believe that Jesus himself, when he was in heaven during those three days, that he went to the altar. It's a symbolic thing. And that that blood covers us. He, the most holy place, that's in the presence of God. My blood was shed for them. When, Jesus, when God looks at me, you ever heard the phrase, see the world through rose-colored glasses? Or maybe you've worn some tinted glasses and you find out you see things differently when you take them off. When God looks at me, he doesn't see my bad stuff because that's been forgiven. He doesn't see my best stuff because my righteousness at good is nothing. But it's like he's seeing me through the blood of Jesus Christ. And he says, come on, welcome home. Because his blood is on me. That blood has been placed on the throne at the altar in heaven, at the throne of God. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies the purifying of the flesh. That's talking about the old way that it was done before Jesus went to the cross. That's not how we do it now. Because he was the greatest sacrifice. He died for us. And somehow that's part of a hero story right there's a lot of heroes that they mimic that gospel story of one who dies to save the world that's what jesus did but that sanctifies the purifying of the flesh how much more shall the blood of christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to god cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living god so jesus got victory over sin and he can work to give us the same victory over sin as well. 
How powerful is that? Jesus got the victory over sin by not giving in to temptation. I was looking at superheroes and their story, and some of you may know the superhero world better than me. Uh, there are some that they are at fault because they do give in to a temptation. Because they're led a certain way or they're pushed to do a certain decision. And they fail. And so their strength is gone. Think, I just read through Judges about Samson. Remember, as long as his hair was long, he had great strength. And that woman kept saying, and he kept going back. And she was trying to find out the secret. You can't lift Samson up as a hero. Because finally he says, shave my head and I'll be as weak as a baby. And she said, okay. And they did it, and he was. Even the Bible champions, David and Samson and Gideon, they all have faults, right? Right? Because they're not the perfect Son of God. They're not Jesus Christ. But Jesus got victory over sin by not giving in to temptation. He is the real hero because He is the Savior of the world. That's what we have to keep speaking and saying. Don't let somebody run down Jesus and say that's not who He really is. You believe the truth. I believe that Jesus is my Savior, that He died for my sins. He's the only one that could do that. No one else. It's not Bruce Willis in the movie Armageddon that sets off the nuclear device on the meteorite so it doesn't hit the earth. That's not the real hero. It's not Superman who can fly around the world somehow backwards and make time go backwards so we can go back and... You know, there's a lot of superheroes and their things, and they do all this stuff, but nobody matches Jesus Christ, I'm sorry to tell you. So if you're, I'm sorry if you're a big fan of Iron Man, or if you put on a cape and a little mask, and I'm Batman. If you do that, I'm sorry if you do that, but those aren't real heroes. The one real hero is Jesus Christ. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Let's bow our heads for just a moment. I want you to think about this a little bit today. Um, hopefully my message was not uh, too hard to understand. Hopefully it was something that was easily understood. I'm just trying to tell you that the reason that Jesus is the real hero of the world's story is because he died for our sins. He couldn't do that if he was a sinner. He has no faults. He has no problems. Do you believe that same way? If you do, amen. But if you are here today and you have never met Jesus Christ as a real person, you can meet him today. All you have to do is admit that you're a sinner, believe that he died for your sins, and confess his name and say, I want to bring Jesus into my life. And if you're interested in knowing more about that at the end of the service, as we have closing in prayer and we leave, if you'll just take me by the hand and say, Pastor Walt, I'd like to know more about salvation. I'd be happy, I can do it, or we have several others who'd be happy to share with you how you can meet Jesus Christ today. So please do not neglect that. Make sure you are right with God. Make sure you're in the right place with God. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your Son to die for us. Thank you for making him into the real hero that he is. All of our heroes have faults, but Jesus never does. He's the perfect Son of God sent to take away the sins of the world. I absolutely believe in that, and my whole life and whole commitment of eternity is based on that Jesus had to be the sinless Son of God to die on the cross to cover me, to take my place. Thank you, Lord, for that. I pray if there's anyone here today that doesn't know you, that they might be interested in knowing what it means to be a believer in Jesus Christ. Please help us to live as though you're our real superhero, the real hero. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. A couple of announcements of importance. If you have a bulletin, there is a paper in there about the ladies' retreat. Unfortunately, the ladies' retreat falls on the same time as these guys' wedding. 
Vanessa, you cannot go on the ladies' retreat. Your presence is required here at the church. Right, David? I don't even hear a hearty amen. He's just shaking his head and saying, yeah. If she's not here, there's not going to be a wedding. So sorry you can't go on the retreat. So, But that's coming up. Easter's coming up. Um, you can give these away if you'd like. There are some chick tracks in the back if you want to take those. Uh, please take some of these and mail them or hand them to your neighbors. Um, prayer chain, if you want to be on it, please fill out the tear-offs and put your name and phone number on it so we can text you or let you know, even if you're already on it. We will have to update it. My new phone doesn't let me see it. So we got to update it. So you will be getting another... If you're on it currently or wanting to join it, you will get a new notification. No coffee and prayer tomorrow, but we will have Bible study at 9 o'clock and at noon, and then Wednesday at 6.30. I'm still looking for help for the 16th. That's Saturday before. Uh, I've got the information where it's at, and I need help doing the cotton candy, the snow cone, and the, and the ice, uh, the snow cone, and the popcorn. So if you can help in any way. Um, I think that's... Oh, discipleship tonight at 6 o'clock. All right? Discipleship tonight at 6 o'clock. And I hear that we need to pray for rain because it's supposed to rain tomorrow. Okay? So I'm going to ask Dave Bisbee. Let's, uh, we're going to sing a song, and then we finish the song. I'm going to ask you to close in prayer and pray for rain. Okay? So let's sing our song. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves. Stand and sing with us, please.